Okay, great. Well, the speaker today is Michael Savas, who's currently at UT Austin, but is uh, from not too long ago from Stanford. So it's great to have him back. So the good news is we have him back. The bad news is uh, that uh, there's a pandemic on. Uh, but the good news is that he's actually visiting and soliciting on Monday. But the bad news, the seminar is, I guess, still virtual. Uh, but the good news is I'm going to shut up and just let him start talking in a second. But his, uh, I, he's going to tell us about reduction of stabilizers and generalized on some tunnels. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much, Ravi, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. It's great to be back remotely and physically. I'm actually down the road a few miles. So I might see some of you on Monday. Who knows? I'll be around in the department. Uh, now, in terms of what I'll be speaking about, it's a slightly technical subject, so feel free to ask questions. I'll try to keep it fairly simple. So for some of you, it might not get interesting until maybe later during the hour, but that's okay. I'd rather, you know, people understand most of what I'm going to say than having people leave, you know, the Zoom confused. So please do, do ask questions, interrupt me. And I have kind of budgeted for that. So I've planned for less than an hour, so we have time to discuss. So please do interrupt me. And in terms of the subject matter, actually, I'll tell you a little bit of an old story with a newer twist. And there are several people actually who have Stanford ties that are involved in this story. So this is something I, I started thinking about when I was a grad student here, but then it uses several theorems and, and, and things that other people have done who either been at Stanford as grad students or have other Stanford ties. So I thought it'd be nice to give such a, such a talk. And the past work I'm gonna be mentioning is joined with uh, Yung Hong Kim and Jun Lee and there's some work in progress I'm gonna be referring to, which is with Jaron Hacking and David Dream. So let me start. So let me start talking about the reduction of stabilizers and what I mean by that. So the setup is fairly naive or simple, if you like. So suppose that the group G acts on a scheme X. So um, what I'd like to do is study the orbit space of this group action on X. And now saying the word orbit space, you have to, kind of, to define what you want or what you mean. So in general, you can consider this a quotient stack. And if you know what that is, great. If you don't, well, it can be complicated or badly behaved depending on what you wanna do with it. So depending on your point of view, it's a great thing to have, but if you want to, to have something that behaves more like a algebraic space or a scheme, this is more general than that. And what is the reason? Well, the reason is that points can have non-trivial or rather infinite stabilizers, right? So you could have things that are fixed by large subgroups or the whole group itself. So the question, again, depend, depending on your application that you have in mind, is can we resolve this scheme somehow g equivariantly such as this new quotient have, has finite stabilizers? And then we can pretend that you know this thing will look something like an orbifold if it's smooth, or in general, it would be a delin Mumford stack. And for applications to enumerative geometry that we're talking about later, that's useful. There's other applications too. So you might want to have such a resolution to think of the class of your stack and the growth and decreeing of stacks. So there's re results, the Bittner relations and so on. So this is a reasonable question to ask for more reasons than what I'm telling you probably. But in any case, I think it's, uh, probably a natural thing to ask. So the setting in which I'm going to consider this question, probably the nicest setting is the setting of geometric environment theory. So let me actually tell you briefly what this is about if you haven't seen it before. So I'm going to assume for technical reasons, I'll tell you why, that G is reductive from now on. Let's say GLN. If you want to think GLN or SLN, that, that's fine. So, now suppose that our X is obtained as follows. So I want it to be the semi-stable locus, and I will say what I mean by that, it's down here, of a scheme P. Now, what is, this, what is the setup coming from? So first of all, I want G to act on a projective space linearly on the coordinates. So I want G to act on PN via a map G to GLN plus one. You could do it with PGL if you wanted, that's the automorphism group of PN, but I want to lift it to the cone somehow. So I have a linear action on PN. And this P is a closed subscheme of this PN that's G invariant under the actions. And then a point in P is semi-stable 
if I can find some gene variant homogeneous polynomial that's non-zero on that point. That in a nutshell, that's what I can say. I mean, there's a more general somehow setup, but you can think of it that way. So it's something that sits in projective space with a linear action with a semi-stability condition. Okay. And then it is a theorem due to Mumford, who I think was probably the first one to develop geometric invariant theory, that you can take a quotient, an orbit space in this case, with good enough properties. So what is the quotient? So the GIT quotient of PN, let me start with that, is the projective spectrum of the gene variant homogeneous polynomials on PN. So that's something you can construct. And of course, the, the kind of advantage it has is projective. And now the GIT quotient of X, which is what we're interested in, it is the image of this semi-stable locus of P inside this GIT quotient if you've composed this way. So you have a, a closed embedding and then you take the image and that gives you the GIT quotient. And then I'm not gonna go into it, but the map from X to the GIT quotient has several nice properties. So in terms of the topology of the orbits, this, this does nice things for you. And I'll give you an example immediately, immediately afterwards to, to show you somehow what's going on. Locally, so if you want to think is as, you know, on charts, there is key, let's say locally, the map, this map looks like spec R to spec RG, where by RG, I mean the fixed, the fixed elements of the ring. So fixed elements R. Okay. That's pretty much the picture. So this is kind of general. And if you haven't seen it before, it's probably not too enlightening. So let me give an example. So here's the example, and the picture kind of gives it away. And I'll come back to this example at least two more times. So it's important at this point that we have no questions about this, right? So please interrupt me if something's unclear. So I want to consider the torus one dimensional, C star with variable T, acting on the affine plane with variables X and Y. And the weights are going to be one for X and minus one for Y. Okay, so this is in this picture. So you see Y is being contracted to the origin. X is being, if you like, dilated away from the origin. And then if I have some other orbit, it's some kind of ellipse, right? That's the action. So this is my V. And I also want to consider the closed subscheme that's cut out by the following two equations, X squared Y and X, Y squared. Of course, I mean cut out by this idea, right? So now let me look at the orbits. So as I advertised, the nicest kind of orbit is this ellipse x, y is equal to t when t is non-zero. And nothing's fixed there, right? So the C star is spanning the whole orbit. So the stabilizer here is the identity subgroup one. There is two orbits that are slightly problematic, as you can see, and these are the two axes, the blue and red axis, right? So I have the x-axis, y is equal to zero. And I also want to remove the origin to get an honest orbit. And this also has an identity stabilizer, right? For the red part, I have x is zero and y non zero. Again, this has an identity stabilizer. And finally, I have somehow the deepest orbit with the biggest possible stabilizer, which is the origin itself, right? So my last orbit is gonna be x is equal to y, is equal to zero, and that is stabilized by the whole group. So, so, I, so I'm happy with everything, except I just want to make sure I'm center notation with U and V. What was U and, so you've got this subscheme cut up by these two equations. What are U and V again? What, what does U and V mean? So V is the plane, the whole plane, okay. what I'm drawing, got and it. U is what's cut out by X squared Y and X, Y squared. So I haven't quite drawn it, but yep. you know. It's, it's closed, the closed subscheme cut up by these guys. Yeah, two axes plus an embedded point. Right, got it. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So in terms of the GIT equations now, what are they? And what's happening with the orbits? So if I consider the coordinate ring of the affine plane, that's CXY, and I want the functions that are fixed by G. Now I'm acting with weight one and minus one. So the only thing that's fixed pretty much is X times Y and everything is generated by that. So the fixed 
functions are exactly the polynomial ring generated by this variable corresponding to xy. So the GIT quotient here, and this is what I've drawn already of this affine plane, is exactly the spectrum of C x times y, which is an affine line. So I might as well write it as CT. And I've drawn this now. So this is in the picture. So you see, you have this dashed orange line. That's my GAT quotient in some sense. And you see that if I have a non-zero coordinate T, so if my T is non-zero, I'm getting these ellipses, right? Or hyperbolas, however they're called. And if T is zero, I'm not getting, you know, a single in some, some somehow zero corresponds to this orbit, the origin, but also these two have somehow been identified with this, right? So all these three orbits count for one. And this is exactly the phenomenon that we're trying to address because the topology of the orbits can be complicated. And this is the case here, right? So if you take the closure of the, of the orbit of the y-axis, so you include zero. If you take the closure of the x-axis, that orbit, the punctured x-axis, you also include the origin. So somehow these two things are identified and they all count as the origin. That's what's happening. And now, how about you? So what about the GT quotient of that? Well, if I take the coordinate ring of you, I get CXY modulo X squared Y and XY squared, right? And then I want to fix by the group action. So, so right now, should we think about this as I've got a map from V to V double mod G and I want somehow the image of you and we're, and we're being, it sounds like you want to be a, a little bit agnostic about what you mean by image, or you're going to tell us what the image is, and then we'll, I'll then I'll nod my head and say yes, that makes a lot of sense. That should be the image. Is that your plan? So, in some sense, uh, I, I want to, or or you're just doing the GIT quotient, or should I think of this as the GIT quotient of this very interesting, highly singular, non-linear scheme? Yeah, I think that's better to think of it that way because you know I, I'm a, I'm a little bit vague about the image because I don't want to give the full definition with linearizations and so on. But yeah, and, and I'm gonna treat things locally in my example. So somehow I think probably an easier way to think about this is just think of these things that are glued kind of globally in a kind of prescribed way because it's a global definition, but I'm giving you the local picture. So right. it's so a little bit uh, so, so this really is gonna be a nice quotient of like you can imagine quotienting just the union of two axes, or you can add some crap, some fuzz at the origin. And now you're actually going to actually see what the what it wants to be. And now the curious question, the suspense, of course, is whether it's going to be the reduced point or thickened and how thickened. Yeah. And, and, and we'll see it come out with some thickening, I guess. Oh, great, cool. Great. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So as, as you're saying, I'm about to write this down. So what is fixed here? So if I quotient out by x squared y and xy squared, so the only thing somehow, the first thing I'm gonna kill is x squared, y squared. That's the first thing that, that, that's, that's kind of fixed that's in this ideal, right? So what I'm gonna get here is cxy mod x squared, y squared. And in terms of my, my variables, so the GAT quotient here is gonna be the spectrum of, if I use the variable t, ct mod t squared so it's a double origin and that's exactly the fuzz i've drawn in this picture so this is how these th things look like in this in this kind of simple case so let me pause here to see if there are any questions so far just to make sure everybody's happy with this picture we'll come back to this and i guess any sort of question is just like allowed including repeating anything yeah no matter how silly you think it is, you should ask it. Yep. All right, so I'll assume things are okay so far and move on. Now, if you look at this picture and wonder about what I asked in the beginning, so we have a stabilizer here. So you see the origin as a C star stabilizer that's infinite. And I asked the question, how can we resolve this stabilizer, right? So I want to somehow take a resolution of this V or this U, if you like, to eliminate the C star. And the question is how you do it. 
And I saw on Discord, there was a question about how canonical will that be? I will comment on that. That will be part of the story. So here's the theorem. And this is due to here one. It's an, by now, it's a fairly, I would say, old theorem, about 1985, I think, the first time Kirwan wrote this up. And then there is some subsequent work by Reichstein. So I'm, group, I'm grouping this together. So suppose G acts on X. It's in this GIT setup that I described. And that X is smooth and something's fixed by G. So I will tell you how to eliminate G, this whole thing as a stabilizer. So what we're going to do is the following. Well. As soon as I mentioned the word resolution, probably most of you are, are thinking blow up. So we're gonna blow up what's fixed by the group action. So X superscript G, that's what's fixed by the group action. It has a scheme structure canonically inside X. And by the way, this X G is smooth. So that's something you can prove if G is reductive. So I'm blowing up a smooth locus of what's fixed inside X, inside X, that's my blow up and then I'm taking a semi-stable locus. So I will explain what that is. So I'm taking a blow up and then deleting some points. And that has an exceptional divisor that's sitting over this fixed locus XG. Now, what am I deleting? So if I take a point in this blow up, I will delete it. I will say it's unstable and throw it away if its orbit closure intersects the unstable locus of the exceptional divisor somewhere. And now I need to, to explain how this is unambiguous. So the exceptional divisor is gonna be the projectivization of the normal bundle or conormal bundle, I'll always confuse these two, of the fixed locus inside X, right? So this fiber wise, if you just think about fibers, the, the, the normal spaces, it will have a linear action by this group G. And now semi-stability makes sense exactly in the way I described it before. So if you go back a couple slides on the exceptional divisor, this condition makes sense because the fiber wise a PN, right? So I can just throw things away. And then if I have something off the exceptional divisor, if you take the orbit closure and you hit that locus, this unstable locus on the exceptional divisor, you throw that away. So Kirwan did not describe this, I think, originally in this way. I think it was buried in that, in, 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 in her theorem somewhere, or the proof of the theorem. Reichstein is, is the person who actually, I think, formulated this way. It's kind of a clean way to show that this is somehow the GIT unstable points. So yeah, so you, oh, you delete yeah. Maybe we're talking about this in Discord, so I'll just ask, what's a quick way to see that XG is smooth here? So a, a quick way to see that XG is smooth. I'm not sure if there is a... Or, yeah, how would you explain it? So an immediate way, you could prove it along the following lines somewhat, but this is not kind of immediately clear. So I think this is not entirely obvious. It was a theorem way back when in the 60s, I think. So somebody did prove it at some point. I don't remember who it was. So maybe somebody knows in the chat. But what you could do is you could assume that uh, you could assume that the action of G because the reductive is linear. So essentially you can reduce to the case of affine space. And there it's kind of obvious because the fixed, the fixed locus is going to be generated by the moving representation. So this is like really splitting a representation into two components. And then you have to embed into AN and show that everything becomes stays regular. So that's kind of the hardest part. So if you're in affine space, it's kind of easier to see. Because if I have some sort of like CX1, X2, and so on, and G acts, the fixed locus will be cut out by the variables that are moving. So in that case, you see it's regular and smooth in the best way possible. And then if you were to reduce to this case, it takes a little bit more work. I think that's probably kind of maybe convincing. I don't know if it's okay, yeah. convincing. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm using the fact that G is reductive or kind of all over the place. So this is one, one case where it's used. And I also used it here. So somehow when, when you consider these fixed, fixed functions, you don't know it's finally generated. So if G is reductive, this is a term due to Nagata that is finally generated. So it has nice properties. So the reductivity is being used all over the place. I didn't say exactly where, but it's important. Yeah. All right, excellent. So let me go back to the to throwing away points. 
So if I throw away these points, then Kirwan and Reichstein show that nothing is fixed by G anymore. So G as a stabilizer has been eliminated by this blow up. And moreover, I'm still in the GAT world. So this X hat still has this GAT description and then I can keep going. So as a corollary, if I do this a million times, eventually I will eliminate all stabilizers. Okay, at this point you should complain and say that, well, maybe something's not fixed by the whole group G, but fixed by some C star, let's say, a torus inside G, not the whole thing. But we can reduce to that case. So somehow by taking a slice, a Luna slice, or I'll get to Jared's work in a, in a second too. So you can take a slice and reduce to this case. So even though this is not the most general case a priori, it's enough to, to do this elimination. Okay. All right, let me go back to the example now. So let me show you how this looks like in the previous example. So if you look here, what did I tell you to do? I told you, let's take the fixed locus, which in this case is the origin and blow it up. So what I'm gonna do is blow up the origin inside the plane. So it probably is the first example of a blow up anyone sees. So here's the picture, here's the blow up, here are my orbits. And now I have to tell you what I'm throwing away, right? So here's what I'm throwing away. So my exceptional divisor here is this P1. And I can think of it as, you know, let me give it coordinates U and V with weights one and negative one. I might, by the, by the way, I might screw up the weights on the nose, but the, the result is gonna be correct. So if I make a typo, please correct me. So I have this P1 with weights one and minus one coming from the normal space, these two axes. And then the unstable locus is exactly zero and infinity. Why is that? Because if I take any homogeneous polynomial in U and V, it will always be zero at zero and infinity, right? I can never somehow take a homogeneous guy and have it miss zero and infinity. So I have to remove those two points. So I have to remove zero and infinity. And not only that, I have to remove anything whose orbit closure limits to those points. And that's the two axes, right? So now what I'm removing, I'm also removing, maybe I should give myself some kind of, what color should I use, orange? So I'm removing this, this axis, this point, this point, and this other axis. That's all I need to remove. And now the claim is that as soon as I did that, the stabilizers are going to be finite. And that's the case. So here, I should probably write down why I removed the axis. So if I have a point whose orbit closure intersects zero or infinity, that implies that P must be on the x-axis or on the y-axis. So that's why I removed those two. And now what is the GAT quotient here or this V hat? Well, it's going to be the blow up of C2 at the origin minus the strict transforms of the two axes. That's what it is. Right? And if you want to write this down, you can think about how to express it. And it has a single affine chart, which is a spectrum of X and then V over U, honestly or inverted. That's what it comes out to be. So by the way, what are the stabilizers here? So if you take a point on a general, on a general orbit, the stabilizer is trivial. And if you take a point on this C star, which is the, the exceptional divisor punctured, well, the stabilizer now is, has cardinality two. So it's Z over two. Because I have V over U and the weights are one and negative one, right? So on the, on, the, on the exceptional, I'm acting by T squared or T to the minus two, depending on how you view it. So if I want to fix something, I get a Z over two one plus, plus minus one, right? So I did introduce something 
but I did eliminate C star. Okay. All good so far? Okay. Now this is the smooth scenario. So you could ask, what if I don't have a smooth scheme, but I have a singular scheme, which is the most interesting case. Then what? So this is a very recent story. So what if X is singular? So this, there's a recent theorem due to edit in and read, or I don't know how to pronounce this surname, but anyway. So, uh, and I'm not gonna give you the details of the theorem, but here's what it says in a nutshell. There's, there's a sequence of what edit in and uh, read call saturated blowups that does this for you. So it produces a resolution X tilde over G that is the Lynn Mumford stack. The theorem is a little bit more refined than this, but let me phrase it this way. And this is a canonical procedure. So you start with your X and you do a sequence of blowups, this modified blowups, and it gives you this, this resolution. You so, should think of- So sorry, maybe, sorry. maybe remind me, so the, so the Kerwan, so in the smooth case, when X is smooth, the Kerwan uh, partial singularization, that's a smooth Dillian Mumford stack or not a smooth Dillian Mumford stack? It is a smooth, as a stack, it's smooth. As, so it a, Z, as a ZIT quotient, of course, it's going to be singular, but it has quotient singularities, finite quotient singularity. Great. So this thing that edited and, and, and uh, have come up with really is the analog. Okay, great. So this is kind of as smooth as it, if you take the stack quotient, the, presumably you take the, you take the Lee Mumford stack quotient and it's really the right thing. It's canonical. Yeah, I, I mean, in in the sense that Arnaud mentioned in chat, like it's comes, to, it just comes handed to you from the yeah. problem, and it's like really as smooth as you could hope, given the nature of the problem, and no matter how crazy, or maybe so, not looking here like you're thinking that that's it. So I'm gonna say that there is gonna be an issue with smoothness, and that's part of the talk today. So, but in the sense that this is kind of replicating Kieran's original procedure, this is kind of the closest you can get. So you're really blowing up the fixed locus inside X as before, and you're throwing up some points. You're throwing away some points. And really the magic of this is what you're throwing away. So, and when X is smooth, it's exactly what I described. So no difference. Now in, um, in my example, for this singular guy, these two axes with embedded points with the embedded origin, this procedure gives you the empty, the empty kind of scheme. So it's not great, even in this example here for this U, already you don't get something meaningful. And that's not a problem. I mean, the theorem kind of tells you when to expect something empty or get a jerk over something. So this is, this is kind of not a bug, but the problem really based on what I want to do later in enumerative geometry is that the fixed locus in X could be horrible a priori, right? So you could give a very singular guy and then you're blowing up a very singular object scheme inside another singular scheme. And that kind of limits you in what you want to do. So smoothness somehow is an issue. I mean, you start with something singular, but you're blowing up a singular sub scheme inside a singular scheme. And that's kind of a horrible thing to do typically. So, okay. So, so the, I mean, I feel like that example is also alarming. I mean, when you make the thing disappear completely, you know, that's pretty serious. I was expecting at least to be surjective. You know, that would be, uh, but instead, you know, I can prove a theorem like this too, where I basically just do her <laughs> one when it's smooth and I make it disappear when it's not smooth. Like that's, uh, uh, but that is not a saturated block. That's a stupid thing. So, so how alarmed should I, I mean, I don't know. I find that alarming. It's not a question. No, it shouldn't be alarming because if you do want to get something with fine stabilizers, maybe you, you will, you will fail at least if you, if you want something like that, but you, you will but you will stop at the gerb over something. Sure. And when you stop at the gerb over something, just think of, you know, of your base. So your gerb over a base and just think about your base and your base is actually going to be nice. So I don't somehow, know, but, but the gerb over the base is also a reasonable thing too. It's a million months. Oh, how bad a gerb is it? Okay, finite. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be kind of a nice gerb, right? Like point mod G to point or, you know. Yeah. So it's not going to be too bad, but the theorem actually tells you gonna, you're going to end at the gerb. So somehow it doesn't guarantee you're going to have finite stabilizers, but it's going to guarantee that at some point, if you cannot blow up farther, you're a gerb over something, and that's something you can consider. That's so, it, it's like you have this group which is constant in the family. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, exactly. You have some sort of like extra, you know, three kind of, and a group that's acting trivially somehow that you want to throw away.
Okay, so now, as I said, the singularity can be an issue, especially if you want to apply this construction to questions in enumerative geometry. And the property that you care about there is virtual smoothness. So it's not smoothness on the nose. It's something, I'm gonna give you some kind of simplistic way to think about it. There's a more general version of this. But what I want to consider is the following scenario. So suppose that my scheme locally is the zero locus of a section of a bundle on a smooth ambient scheme. You can think about this as a global description if you like. You're not, you're not gonna use, you're not gonna miss much. And here everything is G-equivalent, right? So I have a smooth scheme with a G action, a G-equivalent vector bundle, and my S is a G-invariant section. And I want my, my singular scheme to be the vanishing locus of this section. And then I would like to have some sort of resolution that eliminates G as a stabilizer or infinite stabilizers more generally, but inherit the same structure. So I wanted to inherit this virtual smoothness description. And if you do what I described before, there is no hope of this because this, this fixed locus doesn't play well with this virtual smoothness description. And if you adopt the editing, the editing and David Reed kind of viewpoint, it's not clear how to, how, how to carry this out. It will ruin this property actually. You can check it in examples. It's pretty simple to see. So here's the solution. And this is somehow the first result I want to, to tell you about. So this will take a little bit of digesting. So feel free to, to interrupt me. So we'll do what we did be, before on the ambient smooth scheme. So first I take my ambient smooth scheme V and I blow it up along its fixed locus by the group action. That's a smooth blow up of a smooth locus inside a smooth scheme, right? Best scenario possible. So I consider this blow up. It has an exceptional divisor. And then I consider the semi-stable locus in the way I described before. So we're back to the smooth world. We know what to throw away. And now this V hat is going to be my new ambient scheme for my blow up. And I need to give you the data of the bundle and the section. And here's what you do. This is gonna take a, a little bit of uh, understanding. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna start with my bundle and restrict it to the fixed locus VG. As soon as I restrict, I have a fixed part and a moving part because G is reductive. So I can split this as representations in the fixed and moving parts. So I can project down to the moving part. So I have this composition. I take that and I pull it back. So this is the zero. And so moving is just a non-identity, non-trivial representation. Exactly, everything that's non-trivial as a representation, exactly. So I pull it back and I get this composition, right? And then I consider the kernel. You can prove that this is actually a vector bundle. So what's happening is you're twisting the moving part of your bundle when you pull it back by the exceptional. So in some sense, this is a vector bundle. Not in some sense, it is actually a vector bundle. I'm not, I'm not lying. And then the section is kind of obtained for free in some sense. So if you pull back the section and you compose to the projection, because we started with something that's G invariant, you can show that this composition is going to be zero. So you're going to factor through the kernel. And that's your new section. So this is the new set of data. And I will give you an example in a minute. So our definition, so this is originally in some more specific cases due to Yung Hong Kim and Jun Li, and then we together, we define the vanishing locus of this section as hat to be the intrinsic blow up. And then if you throw away unstable points, then we named the Kiron blow up. And here's a surprising fact. So here's the theorem you can prove. These two things, the intrinsic blow up and the Kiron blow up, if you delete unstable points, are intrinsic. So they only depend as a space on U and the G action. That's very surprising at this point because the way I described this for you, it uses all sorts of extra data, right? The bundle, an ambient smooth scheme, a section. This is independent of all of that. And at the time we did by hand. So when we first constructed this, we proved this by hand and there was no good a priori moral reason why this is the case. And we'll get to that later. So let me give you an example because I think this is probably a bit, uh, a bit hard to digest. So let's take the U we had before, X squared Y, X, Y squared inside the affine plane. And let's see what this construction does. And let's compare it with what we had before. 
So we can write, so I need to give you a bundle and a section. So we can write u as the vanishing locus of the differential of a function inside V, where the function is x squared, y squared. Of course, this is a choice, right? So I, do, I am making a choice. So my bundle is the cotangent bundle, and my section is the differential of x squared, y squared, right? And that gives you that idea. So we should think that this is not a coincidence that this example in nature, it's going to come from something like this. Yes. So this is going to be the case with Donaldson Thomas theory that's coming up. Yeah. So what is my new bundle? So my F hat, what am I going to do? I'm going to pull back to the blow up the cotangent bundle of V. And then I told you that I somehow need to twist the moving part by the exceptional divisor. Here, everything is moving. So I have two sections that generate this, dx and dy. And the weights are 1 and negative 1, if I wrote them correctly. Right? So everything is moving. So I'm just going to twist the whole thing by the exceptional device. That's the bundle. So that's what I described earlier. And the section s hat in these coordinates is going to be exactly pulling back x squared y and x y squared. Did I differentiate correctly, by the way? Uh, sorry. I think I differentiated correctly, but I pronounced it wrong. All right, so that's my pullback. And then by twisting, I'm dividing once by the equation of the exceptional divisor, which I'm going to write by xi. So xi is the local equation of the exceptional divisor. That's what I'm doing. So that's my U hat. So my U hat is the vanishing locus of these two equations inside the block. And of course, I'm deleting unstable points in the same way. If you remember my V hat from earlier, I wrote it as spectrum of X and U over V plus minus one. So the equations here, if you write them down, are gonna be just a bit concrete. What you're gonna get is X squared is zero inside the spectrum of C X and U over V plus minus one, which is V hat. So in the equations I had before, I'm just, I'm just getting a double thickening of, of this punctured exceptional divisor. That's what I'm doing. Okay, and you see already the difference, the answer is different than added in and uh, David, right? Earlier I had something empty. Now I have something that's not empty and has this virtual smoothness as, as a kind of byproduct. Okay? All right, and the theorem now is that if you apply this construction a million times, it does give you a delin manfred stack. So what the theorem says is that if you apply this a million times, you get this resolution, which is delin manfred and we called it the intrinsic stabilizer reduction of a GAT quotient stack. And again, there's many ways in which you can eliminate stabilizers. I already told you that the edit in and read one, and now I'm telling you another one. And they're both canonical, and they're both different to each other, but it depends on what you want to do. So, so yours is with, it's not just any Artin stack, it's an Artin stack with a definite, with, with an obstruction, with a, um, uh, a two term obstruction theory. And it, That's or, correct. Uh, and then, so with this data, if, you, if this data of its virtual smoothness, you yep. get this uh, good moduli space, which also is virtually smooth, and you make the, uh, and you get it, which has a Dillian Mumford stack. A good, uh, it's a good moduli mor morphism to a Dillian Mumford stack, right? And then, and it's also virtually smooth. Uh, that's great. Okay, I think I, is that, am I, am I saying that correctly? Is that, that's, that's almost right. So at this point, I haven't mentioned anything about the good moduli space, but it's true that in this picture, so this is the original stack. This is the quotient stack itself. And this is another quotient stack that's Dillian Mumford. And you can augment this diagram with good moduli spaces. 
So part of the construction that I'm not telling you about is that everything here, we're still in the GIT world here. So here we have GIT quotients for free, but that's part of the next theorem that if you have any art in stack with a good moduli space, that's still true. At least and, and, as- And then the good sorry. moduli space is the course, the good moduli, is that the, that's the course moduli space of, of calligraphic M? Uh, yes. Great. Okay. So, so great. So just to give some background for people who haven't seen, it, haven't seen this before. So good moduli space is uh, something developed by Jared Alper, who was, I think his thesis, right? I believe so. And what you should think of is that the stacks I'm, I'm referring to here by a recent theorem by Alper Hall and David Reed, you should think of this map as locally GIT. So this is a heavy theorem. It's not a simple statement, but you should think of this as looking like X mod G to a GIT quotient X double slash G. So in some sense, if you have a stack like that, you can perform this construction and get an intrinsic stabilizer reduction. That's still possible. And this, this involves, it's a little bit, I, I've written it in kind of a misleadingly simple way, but it does involve heavy technology. So this theorem here is actually heavy here. Okay, so this is a complicated result. Okay, so we have this construction and what was the impetus? Why did I want to consider virtual smoothness? So the reason is that the motivation for developing this story was to apply it to Donald's and Thomas theory or enumerative geometry more generally. So let me give you a little bit of background on, on, on what the motivation was. So what is the Ellison Thomas theory in a nutshell? So it's counting sheaves or counting curves through sheaves on a Calabria threefold W. And it can also be, by now you can extend this, it could be a Fano threefold or it could be a Calabria fourfold. And by Calabria, just to be precise, I do mean so the canonical bundle is trivial. And sometimes you do want to, to say that H1O, H10 is zero, something like that. Just to be clear. So the starting point of this of all this theory is the following theorem given Richard Thomas about 25 years ago now, I think 98 or so. So if you just think of the Hilbert scheme of subschemes of this Calabria of threefold which are one dimensional with a curve class beta and holomorphic Euler characteristic N, then Richard proved that this is virtually smooth. And again, I'm not telling you what there is. Ravi used the words. So it has a perfect abstraction theory of visual dimension zero. That's what I mean. And whenever you have virtual smoothness, you can define what's called a virtual fundamental cycle, which is a Chow class in this dimension, this virtual dimension. So in this case, I have an element in the child group of this Hilbert scheme of dimension zero, so a bunch of points. And then if I count the points with multiplicities, I get a number. This number is a Donaldson Thomas invariant that's counting these subschemes in, in this particular theorem. Okay. And the Donaldson Thomas invariant is exactly the degree. And if you deform your, your W, it stays the same. So that's kind of a nice feature. It's one desired feature of this. And the question is. Well, this is a Hilbert scheme. So it's a moduli space that's a scheme, actually. And you can construct it using this GIT yoga, if you'd like. The question is, more generally, you'd like this virtual fundamental cycle for any moduli of sheaves on W. So you could consider complexes, if you like, sheaves of any kind, bundles, and you'd like to have such a counting invariant. And the problem is that this can be an art in stack. So if you think of this as described by a GIT quotient, let's say, that's not always the case, but let's consider it that way. It can have infinite stabilizers or infinite automorphism groups. So you see already, if I give you, let's say, a direct sum of two line bundles, I can scale one of them, I can scale the other. So I can scale in two directions that gives me infinitely many automorphisms. And that's a problem. Because this theory does need your moduli space to be the Lin Mumford, to have finite stabilizers, or be a scheme, if you prefer. So the question is, how do you how do you proceed? And the answer is given by this construction I gave you before. So here's another theorem, due to myself and Yehong Kim and Jun Lee, which is that if M 
is any moduli stack of semi-stable sheaves or complexes on a smooth projection Calabia threefold, anything that comes up in life pretty much, you can consider Bridgeland stability, Gieseker stability, polynomial stability, most things that come up in nature or that we've invented, if you like. So you can define this intrinsic stabilized reduction and it carries this virtual smoothness. So the theorem has two components. One, this M is good enough that it has this intrinsic stabilized reduction. And two, it has this virtually smooth structure. And this is a combination of many different theorems. So this uses a lot of stuff. So the fact that this intrinsic stabilized reduction is defined uses a recent theorem by, is it Alper, Halper and Leisner and Heinloth, I believe. And then the virtual smoothness uses a lot of stuff in derived geometry. So this is Pantef, Toy, and Vakivetsozi, Joyce et al, and Chang and Lee. So in any case, this does two things at once. It eliminates stabilizers and it carries over this virtual smoothness. And at that point you can say, well, I can define Donaldson Thomas invariants again by taking degrees of the virtual fundamental set. So the whole point of this construction was to give some sort of resolution that preserves visual smoothness. That's really what this is about. Okay. And the question is at this point, why? So you should be very suspicious of two things. One, why was this M tilde intrinsic? And secondly, if it's intrinsic, what's up with this virtual smoothness? Because this virtual smoothness did, did uh, depend on external data, right? So somehow you should be slightly suspicious of this. All right, so let me pause here and see if there are any questions before I give you somehow the moral justification for what's going on. Can you maybe say that again? So, so we should be suspicious. So the question is, so could you just repeat the last couple of sentences again? Yes, so there is two issues potentially here. One, I define this M tilde, this intrinsic stabilized reduction by using extrinsic data. So I used, for example, the bundle, the ambient smooth scheme, the section. So, and I told you this is intrinsic. It actually doesn't depend on any of that. So that's something that should be suspicious somewhat because there's no reason why it would be that way. And the other thing that's kind of non-obvious is that even if virtual smoothness, for example, is uh, preserved locally, you know, if you, if you think about it more, it's not clear how you put all this, these things together. So that's part of the complication. But the, the real, somehow, the why refers to the fact that why is this working? Right. <laughs> because somehow, you know, the most obvious thing to do would be what uh, Edwin and David Reed did, right? Just blow right. up the fixed locus honestly and see what you can say about that. And that's what they did. And they generalized all the results and kind of somehow the best way possible. But that's not good enough to do enumerative geometry if you have you know, sem strictly semi-stable objects. Okay. So in the last uh, few minutes, maybe eight to 10 minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about derived algebraic geometry, which is the moral justification for why all of this is working. So when we first defined this intrinsic and Kiron blow-ups, there was no notion of uh, derived blow up. So there was no notion of blow up in derived geometry, whatever that would be. So that's why we did everything by hand. And somehow the hope or the intuition was that there's gonna be some, somehow derived upgrade of this whole story that's gonna make everything neat and explain why everything works this way. So that's true. But before we get there, let me say what derived algebraic geometry is about. Again, very briefly and maybe simplistically. So what is classical algebraic geometry about? So this is what we learn in a class typically. So we have our spaces, which are spectrum, locally spectra of rings. Their points are prime ideals of the ring. And the important point of view is that the functions are given by this ring R. And derived algebraic geometry is basically the same thing, but more technical, very technical actually, it's a hard subject, where you replace your ring by a commutative differential graded ring. So you want to take a CDGA in non-positive degrees. So that's why I'm putting the bullet on top. That's because it's some sort of complex that's graded and has a differential, okay? And a multiplication too. And then your space is spectrum of this, whatever that means. And then your points are the prime ideals of the cohomology in degree zero. So your points are still the same somehow okay and 
I'll give you an example because this might be, I don't know if that's familiar, but every derived scheme has a classical truncation, which is a classical scheme that's locally given by the spectrum of H0. So that's always true. The way you should think of this, so this is analogous in usual algebraic geometry to taking the reduced subscheme or the reduction of a scheme X. This is somehow what this is. And the primary example, so if you want to forget everything I just said, but think about, keep one thing in mind. So if U is virtually smooth, so if it has a bundle intersection and ambient smooth scheme, then the best example to keep in mind of a derived scheme is the Kozul complex. So if you consider the Kozul complex given by the bundle intersection, this is going to be our CDGA. So I'm going to start with at some point zero, and then I'm going to have the determinant, and then all the way to the second alternating power, first alternating power, and then at each step, I'm contracting by the section. So this is going to be kind of the prime example of a CDGA. Just take the Kozul complex of a section of a bundle. And if you see what's going on, so the degrees here are zero, minus one, minus two, all the way to minus R, which is the determinant. And then H zero of this R is exactly OV mod the ideal generated by the section, right? So this is exactly U. Or if you like, it's the, the functions on U. Something like that. So just keep this in mind, if this is confusing. In the derived geometry world, I'm just thinking of the Kozul complex as opposed to it's just zero cohomology. So I want to remember the bundle in the section somewhat, up to homotopy at least. And the classical truncation of this is exactly here. So the spectrum of this Kozul complex is classical truncation X classical, which is our original scheme. So you see now this extra data that I referred to before is part of the derived structure that I'm considering on this derived scheme. Okay, that's the example. So now I have to talk about blowups. Actually, let me let me pause for a minute. I, I do have time. Are there any questions before I, I go ahead? So the classical story would be like you're taking F dual to OV. And then that's quasi, that's basically the same as OV mod S dual. And that's your original thing. Yeah. And then now you're adding these higher things. And I have to think about why, because the causal complex is, of course, is exact beyond that anyway. So I feel like there's not. Well, it's not exact if you're not regular, right? I mean, this could be horribly singular. Oh, oh, oh excellent. Now I get it. Good. Thanks. Yeah. So, yeah, what's really happening and what Ravi is alluding to is that what's going on here is that I'm keeping what I had before, and in some sense, I'm keeping extra data in negative cohomological degrees, right? They have to do with how singular this is. If this was, you know, if this S was cutting out a regular scheme, then of course I could throw everything away. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. So let me talk about blowups now and how everything ties together. So just to define, have some language. So in derived geometry, a map from Z to X is a closed embedding if the corresponding map of the classical underlying schemes is a closed embedding. That's a little bit counterintuitive, you think about it, because it's saying that all I need is the map of rings on H0 to be surjective. But in the other cohomological degrees, you could have all sorts of stuff happening. You have the zero map, you have injective things, you could have, doesn't really matter. So being a closed embedding, it's only a condition on the classical underlying space. And here's a theorem that's last year, due to Jaron Hacking. So this is 2021. And the theorem is that for any such closed embedding, there exists a derived blow-up. So this is a derived scheme that acts in the derived world as blow-ups do in the classical world. And it, and it satisfies a similar universal property, for example? That's exactly right. So I've written this down. So it classifies virtual Cartier divisors over Z, included into X. <laughs> And a virtual Cartier divisor is essentially a Kozul complex of a line bundle. So somehow 
this is what it has a universal property and you know Jaron proved that you know it's it's represented by some kind of nice risk algebra and all sorts of stuff so it has all these nice properties that you'd like to do and a universal property as well that's kind of extending what we know exactly and now here's a theorem due to myself and Jaron so let x be a classical scheme with a g action so we're going all the way back to the beginning then the intrinsic blow up I described earlier is actually the derived blow up of the fixed locus of X inside X. And here's, this is very surprising. Why? Because these are two are classical schemes, right? So I'm taking a derived blow up of a closed embedding of classical schemes. And I'm showing that this derived blow up is recovering the intrinsic blow up. And now this kind of a moral justification of why everything worked. So why was this intrinsic? It's because, well, the fixed lobe is intrinsic, X is itself, and then the derived lobe is just the procedure. I mean, there's nothing to worry about. So this is true. It's not a very hard theorem, by the way. It, it takes a little bit of computation, but it, it's not too hard to show. So it's more going through the motions and checking that everything works. So this is kind of the first, the first step in making everything derived. Now, what are the next steps that are in progress? So this is joint work that's currently in progress with uh, Jaron and David. So to, to completely generalize this story, you need to do the following things. You need to define the fixed locus for any derived G scheme, because ideally you'd like to say, I'm starting with something derived, and then I want to do a derived intrinsic stabilizer reduction. And to make sense of that, you need the fixed locus. So we have an idea for this is to use vial restriction for the morphism BG to a point. And then you need to check that it kind of recovers what you hope it will be. So there is, we have a guess for how this looks locally, and then we want to globalize this using vial restriction. And then the second step is to do the virtual smoothness part. So we want to show that the derived cotangent complex of this derived blow up is exactly the virtual smoothness that we constructed before. And of course, you know, another step is to do all of this for good moduli spaces, stacks with good moduli spaces. But let's start with quotient stacks first. And if I want to say a few more words, it's buzzwords, more precisely, what we want is to study the pullback of the minus one shifted symplectic form on what you start from to the intrinsic stabilized reduction. So this is really a story about pull derived symplectic geometry. That's really what's behind this. And I didn't tell you anything about it. But these are the two next steps. All right, so I think I'm, I'm basically out of time and I'm also done. So thank you very much for the attention and uh, I'm happy to, to answer any more questions or discuss further.